Hey everyone, welcome back, and today we're going to talk about the symbology modes in the AH64D. And while we get ready to do that, just go ahead and hit that like and subscribe for me, and let's get to it. So first off, we have to understand what the symbology system is. Remember, we have this monocle eyepiece over our right eye, and it can only be on the right eye. And that is essentially a heads-up display, giving us flight and targeting data, and it can be used to display four distinct modes, depending on which we select via the symbology select switch on our cyclic. As you may recall, we have a two-position switch here, which can cycle through the four modes, starting at the top with cruise mode. We'll actually start for the sake of simplicity with the hover mode. This mode shows us basic flight information, such as airspeed, altitude, aircraft heading, mass torque, but it also shows us some unique features that may not make a lot of sense to you, so we'll try and explain those for you now. Most of these translate across the four modes, so understanding them in one will help you for the rest of the tutorial. We'll start at the bottom, and this is your high action display format. This gives you a variety of information at a glance. Starting here on the left, you'll see which site is selected, and to the right of that, the range and range source selected, which includes the laser, navigation, auto, manual input, or radar in the case of the FCR. Below that is the site status, and there are a ton of different messages that can be displayed there, as you can see. In the center, you'll see a field of regard box, and this is basically a condensed picture of your selected sensor's azimuth and elevation slew limits. The small box inside, called the field of view box, displays the view of whatever sensor you're set to and its position in relation to the nose of the aircraft. Put another way, centered means you're looking straight out, while hanging over the left side of the box means it's oriented to the left. To the right of the box, you have your acquisition select status, which tells you which acquisition source you're tracking. Below that is some weapon select data, which confirms your weapon you have actioned, as well as any information you have regarding that weapon, such as bore sight requirements, laser tracking, and some other failures. We'll touch more on acquisition sources in a later video. Two items can appear above the field of regard in the case of a failure or a limitation. You have the HMD owner queue, which informs you of which view you're actually seeing during a failure in the processor, which may display the other crew member's view in your own eye, which obviously can be very disruptive to safety of flight. Below that, you can have a weapons inhibit message, which is essentially telling you that something is prohibiting the selected weapon from firing due to some sort of factor. In the center of your view, you have some crosshairs, and this is referred to as the line of sight reticle, or LOS reticle. It's used as a reference for the user's line of sight, an aiming cue for weapons employment, as well as used for bore sighting the HMD. Around that are the queued line of sight dots. These help you orient to whatever acquisition source you're tracking. So for instance, if you're queued to see the co-pilot's line of sight, and he's looking down and to the left, you'll see a dot appear on the left and bottom of your reticle, essentially pulling you towards his line of sight, which will appear as a hatched crosshair, and that'll be whipping around your view as he turns his head. Now let's talk about the kind of hard part, uh, how that symbology affects your flying. There are two symbols that we really need to focus on, the acceleration cue and the velocity vector. These both represent different speeds based on the mode selected. Additionally, you need to view the line of sight reticle now as a top-down representation of your aircraft, with up being forward. Picture the acceleration cue as your cyclic. Now some will pull an actually on me and say that it isn't really representing the cyclic, but this also won't steer you wrong. If you place the cyclic forward and right, this cue will also move there, indicating your desired acceleration. This line, the velocity vector, will extend outwards from the line of sight reticule, which again is your aircraft, towards that acceleration cue. Now you're smart enough to know that I can quickly move my cyclic and the aircraft will have a delayed response, so movement of the cue and the vector are not fully in coincidence. This can sometimes lead the new pilots chasing the symbology instead of just looking past it and flying the aircraft through ground reference particularly at a hover where small movements at the controls are expected. Looking above the line of sight reticle, you see what is called the head tracker, and this is a neat little item that comes in more handy than you probably think. It's a constant reference point as to where the nose of the aircraft is. As you're flying and fighting and watching all these things move around, sometimes you can get a little lost as to which way is up. The head tracker gives you a known point to relate your brain and can be useful in establishing your sight picture during different maneuvers. Now let's look at the modes themselves. In the hover mode, your acceleration cue and velocity vector are present along with your line of sight reticle and your head tracker. Clicking up on the symbology select switch takes us into transition mode, which is almost identical, except for the addition of a dashed horizon line and a destination point, with information such as waypoint name, distance, range, and time to arrival. You also get a flight path vector, which should be familiar to anyone who flies any sort of advanced aircraft simulation. Cruise mode isn't typically used in the community, at least in my experience, though I'm hearing from guys that it's coming back in vogue during instrument flight. It adds a bank angle and attitude indicator, which typically aren't that useful for a helicopter in the same way as it would be in a fixed wing aircraft. Hover bob-up mode takes all the information from the hover mode and adds a reference or bob-up box. This octagon represents roughly 12 square feet of ground and indicates a relative position to where the mode was activated. 
Maximum displacement of the box from center represents about 40 feet, and it can be used to offset yourself from known obstacles as you enter a confined area. This box can be helpful when you're trying to hover straight up in a battle position. The trick I learned was just to keep that acceleration cue inside the box and the aircraft will follow suit. Simply make small adjustments while increasing your collective to the proper altitude, then slap on the hold modes and eat a snack while the front seater does its business. It's important to understand that the heading tape and velocity vector data does not adjust based on the head position. If you look to the right at 90 degrees, the heading tape is still based on your aircraft heading and the cues discussed are still functioning from the line of sight reticle. Your flight path vector will not be present, however, as it's still hanging out wherever your aircraft is heading. There's a lot going on with the symbology, a lot, and it'll mess new kids up like nobody's business, me included. At the end of the day, just fly the aircraft. Ignore the cues and just use your pilot skills when things get messy. Keep the spinny side up and the wheels pointing down and the rest will work itself out. If you like these videos, throw me a like and subscribe. Be sure to check out the podcast, The Low Level Hell. A new partner to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, it's a show that explores the world of rotary wing and air-to-ground combat. So have a listen and enjoy the stories. Check out our website listed below, and we'll see you guys next time.